Welcome to Women in International Energy, Empowering the Transition. My name is Geraldine DeBastian, and I'm honored to present the series of discussions on current issues around renewable energies hosted by the producers of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. Renewable energy and global energy transition promise to be one of the key drivers in a post-COVID economy and also one of the key drivers of the Green Deal. In order to enable global transformation of energy systems and the power of innovation in renewable energies, we really need all talent to be included. However, the global energy sector lacks diversity and gender equality. Women are severely underrepresented in management positions. In this panel session, we want to explore how the situation can be changed by examining political, business and social obstacles to women, as well as opportunities to increase gender equality in the renewable energy sector and what personal success strategies can lead us there. I am so honored to be joined by three experts on this topic that I would like to introduce to you now. Dr. Amani Abu Zaid is the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy at the African Union Commission. She is in charge of the sectors energy, transport, tourism, and ICT. Prior to joining AUC, Dr. Ama Abu Zaid has served for more than 30 years in leadership roles and top tier international organizations, such as the African Development Bank, USAID, and UNNDP, with a focus on infrastructure and energy programs. She has received numerous international awards and recognition for her leadership and excellence, including being recognized as a world young leader by the European Union. It's such an honor to have you here today with us, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for finding the time. Um, I'm also very excited to be joined by Christine Lintz. She's the co-founder and executive director of WGNet, the Global Women Network for the Energy Transition, which really aims at empowering women in the sustainable energy sector. Her professional journey over the past 30 years has been to advance the energy transition with renewables and energy efficiency, beginning at the regional level in her home country, Austria, and then exploring the European and the global level. Prior, Christine was working as Executive Secretary of REN21, the Renewable Energy Policy Network of the 21st Century, headquartered at the United Nations Environment Program. Welcome, Christine Lins. And I am also very excited to be joined today by Catherine Lucy, who is the founder and international executive director, uh, officer, excuse me, of Solar Sisters, an innovative last mile distribution solution for clean energy technologies in rural Africa that taps into the power of women entrepreneurs. Catherine is an Ashoka Fellow and Draper Richards Capelin Foundation Entrepreneur. She has received recognition and awards for her work at Solar Sisters, including the Clinton Global Initiative and International Center for Research on Women Champion of Change Award. Prior to becoming a social entrepreneur, Catherine spent over 20 years as an investment banker on Wall Street, providing structural finance solutions to the energy sector. It's great to have you here with us, Catherine. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So before jumping in to our discussion today, we want to give the floor to Christine Lintz for a short overview presentation. And the stage is yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine. Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are watching us. It's my great pleasure to um, be here with the session uh, today and uh, to um, just share a couple of insights uh, on women in energy empowering the transition. GWNet, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, uh, was uh, founded in 2017, so we're a fairly young organization with the aim to advance the energy transition by empowering women in this space, uh, because we are convinced that if there would be more inclusiveness, uh, they, this energy transition would advance more uh, quickly, but also in a more just way. So, uh, the energy transition as such is, a, as the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies defines it, is a multidimensional, complex, non-linear, non-deterministic process. It radically reforms the existing energy supply and uh, demand systems, 
but it goes beyond just replacing fossil to clean resources. It uh, changes consumption, distribution, investment patterns. Uh, it requires new coalitions and capabilities of actors, new socio-technical regimes of policy, regulation, mindsets, uh, beliefs, and social practices. It be requires behavior change, innovation, integration across all sectors. We are not only talking about uh, the electricity sector, but also about heating, about clean cooking, etc. And this will require diverse backgrounds, capabilities and perspectives, and uh, it will require a large uh, and diverse pool of talent. And so when we look at uh, where we currently stand in the energy field, uh, according to IRENA, the International uh, Renewable Energy Agency, there are about 11.5 million people working in the renewable sector. That's the latest figure from uh, 2019. And the projections are that this figure will increase to 42 million jobs uh, in 2050. And when we see that today, the share uh, of women in the renewables workforce is with 32% higher than the share of women in traditional oil and gas sectors, where it's only 22%, the sector will only thrive if we get the best talents of both men and women, and, uh, and that's exactly uh, what is needed. And uh, when we look at, at some um, studies, we clearly see that not only is the, the right to have access to employment a human right, which uh, women should have on equal terms with men, but we also clearly see, and there are numerous studies, that uh, gender equality improves global GDP. And we see that companies with diverse leadership have better results. They are better prepared to survive financial shocks. I think that soon we will see studies that these companies also are better prepared uh, to overcome or to survive in the current pandemic. They have increased profitability, increased innovation, uh, and also increased action on environmental issues uh, and often more stringent decarbonization policies. So that's, uh, that's out there in, in um, uh, a number of studies. And uh, I will use the words of Christine Lagarde, uh, the, the current uh, president of the European Central Bank, who said when more women join the workforce, everyone uh, benefits. Uh, we know that there are a series of policies and solutions uh, to increase women's participation in the sector from uh, mainstreaming gender perspectives, uh, creating networks, supporting uh, infrastructures, mentorship programs, access to education and training, gender targets and quotas, workforce policies and regulation. Uh, and, uh, and also, of course, work-life balance is, uh, is an important uh, element. And we also know that uh, we need networks. And uh, GWNet works in partnership with many regional and national women in energy networks uh, to connect women uh, and to uh, showcase their expertise. Uh, so uh, whoever is on, on the panel today uh, or on this webinar, we are more, more, most welcome to join uh, a global network of over 1,400 members from 100 countries uh, to ensure that your work is visible and also to make sure that you uh, make the right connections. Uh, this was it from me in a nutshell. Back to you, Geraldine. Thank you so much. Christine and thanks for that overview presentation. We want to jump right into the discussion and I would like to first invite Dr. Amani Abuzaid to share her thoughts on what you just presented. Um, Commissioner, you have been in this field of work for such an impressive long time and have also achieved so much yourself to to get more women into positions working in this field. What do you think have been the more successful strategies that you have tried to use yourself over the course of your career to break open these male dominated domains? Um, first of all, I mean, let me congratulate Christine for uh, uh, a pertinent uh, presentation, I think it's, it's very telling also of the situation of women in this sector. Uh, you know, in, in, in our countries, and here I'm speaking practically for, for the whole of Africa, in, uh, society and the culture and the uh, traditions play an important role. Maybe I, in, in my case, uh, uh, I, I was lucky, maybe I was not brought up, you know, in a stereotypical uh, manner, but having said that, uh, studying uh, engineering uh, uh, 
there were a large number of people uh, 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 at the University of Cairo. I mean, almost 30 to 40 percent of the students. And the problem is not actually in some societies at, at, the, uh, at the education level, uh, uh, rather after the education level, that there are also the problems they face in the work in the workplace. Um, uh, uh, but this is not the case everywhere. Women in STEM are very few still, worldwide and in Africa as well. And there's always this uh, 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 stereotype that these are not, I mean, the sectors are not, are not for women or are not for girls. I really don't know why. And when people ask uh, about, because it's hard work, uh, apparently they have not tried to be a farmer, for instance, a woman farmer, to know really what kind of hardships and what kind of problems they are facing. Uh, so uh, uh, what is important is that to set the right policies, to set the right tone, and leadership plays an important role when it comes to women empowerment. But I want to uh, maybe highlight, uh, uh, and I'm sure the, the, the panelists, the distinguished panelists here know about that. In Africa, there are 870 million people who do not have access to clean food. And the majority of those are women. And it's upon them the burden of fetching firewood or coal or cutting the trees or going long distances to just for cooking, let alone access to electricity, which you have, we have 600 million Africans who lack access to electricity. These are frightening numbers and tragic at the same time. So we cannot really assume that, uh, 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 or still, as I always say, knowing that there is such situation in the world. Now, this situation is also exacerbated by, uh, by the global crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. I'm saying this because at the end of the day, the burden uh, of uh, uh, whether it's the, uh, because of, uh, you know, the traditional roles of households, uh, cooking and uh, caring for others. I mean, the, the, the burden falls on women. Uh, the, the, the death toll and fatalities and the serious accidents, also women. We lose 600,000 lives every year due to uh, accidents, you know, the use of kerosene or other uh, forms of, of fumes uh, uh, from, the, from the, uh, the traditional cooking ways that are used. Uh, the the number of having said that, well, this is one side of the story. We also are seeing an emergence of lots of young people, uh, young women who are getting into the field. I'm also very proud that there's a number of ministers of energy across the continent. I'm also very proud that there are a number of women who are leading uh, uh, national programs and large programs in uh, in energy. And uh, what is lacking, and I, I like very much what Christine mentioned, is visibility. So it is important that this event gives visibility, not only to the women here present, but also give credit and visibility to all the women out there, out there who are doing a fantastic job. Thank you so much, Commissioner. You just raised so many important points that I hope we can all get back to during the course of the conversation. I want to pick up on one and invite Catherine and Lucy to join the conversation because, as you correctly said, with all feminist issues and definitely also with female equality in the en energy sector, we need to look at the bigger picture and see things in an intersectional way. So whilst we're talking about women in management positions in the energy sector, we also need to look at the women in the consumer position and, and their rights and roles. And this is something that Catherine Lucy is addressing with her NGO Solar Sisters. So Catherine, can you share a little bit how you're trying to address exactly this issue that the commissioner raised in your work? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Solar Sister was founded really um, to address this particular issue. Um, it was came out of the observation that uh, clean energy, distributed solar energy is just an amazing solution for rural households to have light and electricity. And um, it became affordable and available and appropriate solution. And yet it wasn't happening. People weren't making that transition from burning kerosene at their households for light to using solar lamps for light that were very abundantly available, but just not reaching the last mile rural markets. 
And Solar Sister was founded really to address that issue. And um, the solution was um, looking at the markets, looking at who is the customer first. And the customer was that woman who's managing the household energy, the woman who was walking miles to collect kerosene and collect firewood and put a meal on the table and take care of her children and daily making the decision about how is she going to power her life. And we needed to reach her and let her know that there was a better solution that was safer and cleaner and uh, more economical for her household. And the best way to do that was to uh, use the local resource of local women entrepreneurs who became, who started, we work with them to start businesses and seed their businesses and um, provide them business training and support. And then those local women entrepreneurs, the ones we call the solar sister entrepreneurs, bring the clean energy to their community. And then through their networks of family, friends, neighbors, cousins, second cousins, uh, church groups, uh, they reach out through their community, through these trusted social networks. And they both educate their community about the benefits of clean energy, and they make the product available to them in a market-based uh, distribution business. And so it has two incredible impacts. One is the access to the clean energy for rural communities so that we see um, we have over 1.8 million people have changed from using kerosene to uh, solar lighting for their homes. And it's also the economic opportunity for the women themselves because as they're creating these businesses, their renewable clean energy businesses, um, they're earning an income that they then reinvest in their family and in their business and in their communities. So we see it as really a, a two-pronged approach that um, each side supports the other because women, as they are making business, make, making good business decisions, are also making good economic and environmental decisions. So it's, um, as you can tell by our name, Solar and Sister, from the very core, we believed that this intersection of clean energy and women is essential in order to get clean energy really distributed at the household level in um, massive scale. Thank you, such impressive work that you're doing. And, and um, maybe we can go on to discuss a little bit where also the linkages are between the kind of work you're doing and then looking at things from a sort of policy level as well. Um, GWNet, I feel, is this wealth of knowledge where you're trying to connect all these conversations, Christine Lynn. So you're looking at topics from this very grassroots perspective, as well as from a management or um, or policy perspective, at least in the different um, papers that you present, the different conversations that sort of happen on your portal. And I wanted to invite you to share a little bit how you think creating these kind of networks and knowledge bases is an important strategy also for bringing more women to the conversation in general and enabling more women to join actively the sector. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, you know, the way we started was it was a very simple one. I mean, when I was, uh, as you mentioned initially, I've, I've dedicated my entire career so far to to the sustainable energy field, and so I have been at lots of conferences doing presentations, and it just happened that that women came, younger women came towards me and said this was really inspiring. Uh, we like role models, and and so. I mean, I honestly, I didn't really realize, uh, but then slowly I just noticed, okay, there are not so many of us uh, out there. And, uh, and, and when looking, there are different initiatives, but they're all a bit scattered. And so what we said is, uh, I'm a big fan of connecting the dots because I believe that the sum of all the parts is, is more than just the, these individual elements. And so uh, we have decided to, to create that, that platform to really give women uh, a voice, but also to, to, to generate data, because it's very clear that uh, in our current statistics, uh, be it on employment uh, or also in the energy field, there is a lack of gender disaggregated data. And when our policymakers do not know uh, what the issue is, it is very difficult to, 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 to bring this into the, the policy discussion. And, uh, there are good practice examples, uh, for example, ICRI, uh, the, the ECOVA Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, um, they have developed uh, a guide on how to mainstream uh, gender aspects in energy policy making. So there, there are these things out there, and I'm, I'm a big believer also that 
if something works in one part of the world, your one doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. And uh, and so when that when others know about it, they can uh, they can develop it further. They can apply it uh, there. And we have also back in 2018 started with uh, with setting up a mentoring program because I think one of the issues why uh, women sometimes um, they sometimes need a bit of encouragement to to go up the next step uh, and they need a bit of a boost for their self-confidence uh, and so we have initiated this program uh, the first one back in 2018 in the meantime uh, we have several programs for mentoring women in in wind in energy storage but also in, we did some with the german energy partnership programs for latin america and the MENA region and commissioner i'm very proud to say that we have just set up uh, a mentoring program for women in clean cooking because I, I absolutely agree with with what you said this is a sector which needs when more needs to happen because if we are serious about reaching sdg7 uh, and we only have 10 more years to go then uh, it's clear that the clean cooking sector is really lagging behind, and uh, and this is this is not a luxury. This is an absolute need uh, to to provide solutions there. And we have just initiated a program together with the Clean Cooking Alliance and SE for All for women in uh, in clean cooking, uh, which uh, had over 160 uh, applications from both Africa and uh, and the Asian continent. And uh, we are, we, are, we are really uh, you know. Uh, doing step by step and and, and uh, providing a platform to have everybody come on board uh, whoever uh, is interested in in advancing the cause of women in this field because it will ultimately help to uh, speed up the energy transition uh, as such as well if i may please uh, yes i mean uh, thank you very much christine and again uh, uh, to show, uh, I mean, how that the biases, or the, not only the biases, the gender blindness when it comes to uh, policy or when it comes to uh, energy strategies. Rarely you would find any, uh, you would find a, a mention of clean cooking, uh, uh, and 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 that that's again in itself a demonstration, you know, of the uh, of this blindness and also uh, the fact that women seem to be. Uh, in, in in many ways uh, excluded from the from the uh, policy uh, or the decision making decisions it's not something that they they i mean that is put on the table when when we talk about energy i mean as if it's it does not exist so i wanted to stress that point also the importance of in addition to the very important point that Christine mentioned, the importance of the uh, gender uh, disaggregated data, but also women in, 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 in policy and decision making decisions uh, uh, is very uh, important. And uh, that is also because I want to really move us from uh, thinking of women constantly as, you know, the vulnerable group, the poor group, they constantly need the uh, assistance, they need to know we want women in the top positions. We want them not only for the uh, uh, heads of small and medium enterprises. Uh, you know, we set uh, 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 the African Network for Women in Infrastructure to promote women-led, women-owned enterprises, big ones, huge ones, to work in infrastructure at large, to access the largest finance possible. And when you look, this a fragment of the markets are given to women, which is very serious. So now we have put a, we are pleading actually pleading for a pleading for a, a share in procurement uh, uh, of infrastructure projects, including energy, to be at least ten percent for women-owned, women-led enterprises. That is an incredibly powerful tool and leads directly into the next question I was going to ask, um, which is if looking at these really exciting grassroots initiatives and initiatives coming from civil society and other actors trying to promote these topics, how from a policy level commissioner are you planning or can one possibly support them in order to enable them to scale? And I think what you just mentioned using procurement is, is an incredibly exciting, interesting tool. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit or also include other examples of how you're trying to support this from a policy approach. Uh, procurement, visibility, and data, because I, I'm returning again to data, because data is a very uh, powerful tool. 
This is how you make decisions. This is how you build your policy. So if your uh, policy, uh, you, yeah, the information that you're having is gender blind, then your policy will be gender blind. Your strategy will be gender blind. Uh, if no one around the table, sitting on the table or in the sea room, or the, uh, no one is talking about what the impact of the lack of uh, energy, especially renewable energy on, uh, or clean energy on women, then no one will consider it in the policy making. So it is very important to have women around the table. It's very important to have the powerful tool, which is information and data, to just, you know, to have. Again, policy, economy, businesses are based on numbers. Show me the numbers, and then I will set you the policy right. But then again, if, if these figures do not exist, then the, the problem almost does not exist. So one, make sure that we have compared cases when we are addressing the, the issue, and it's not uh, it's not just about philanthropy. It's not because we are. Uh, uh, I know people use the term feminist. Okay, businesses maybe they don't know this term. They don't use it. Fine. We we're talking about growing. We're talking about GDP. We're talking about making profits. The only way for us to recover from uh, COVID nineteen to make money to grow. To, uh, to improve the GDP and improve our economies is the inclusion of women. So that, that is, that is I mean, proven over and over again. And I've just seen it also in Christine's presentation. And it's true. I mean, $27 trillion are lost every year worldwide just because women are not included. So uh, these are compelling figures. Uh, uh, and in Africa, more than ever, because Africa, we, we are really want to um, uh, increase the pace, expedite the, the work that we're doing. We have a, a, a large number, I mean, large population that we need to cater uh, to and, and help create jobs for uh, women and men. So the only way is to make sure that uh, 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 everyone is included in the processes. Absolutely. Catherine, I'm wondering if this is one of the connection points also between the work that you're doing and the policy level to enable people to have their own like data narratives is a term we use in my uh, more tech driven field of work and to create uh, connection points to enable policymakers to have the data coming also from the women that you're working with. Is that is that a, co a connection that's existing or one you'd like to build? Absolutely. Solar Sisters is like a living laboratory. We um, see ourselves as a, a role model and an example of what happens when you deliberately, intentionally include women in the uh, clean energy solution and just how powerful of a um, success rate we've had is something that we hope is um, very, very visible to others and that we work very hard to make sure that we share the stories as well as the data because the data is compelling and it tells exactly that including half of the population or excluding half the population is going to, you're not going to be able to get to where you want to go. But when you include that half the population, when you include women, you find that they have resources, they bring local resources that um, are currently untapped, that they have knowledge and expertise in the markets that, um, are ignored if they're not included. And um, it's just it's it's just a powerful uh, engine forward to include women as well. And then the data is made real and made shareable by adding the stories to it. And when you meet the women entrepreneurs, when you find out how um, incredibly brilliant they are in their local markets, in building a business that meets their market's needs, how they uh, learn by doing and reinvesting their money back into their business and growing their business and the ambitions that they have. And when you see their children and especially their daughters look up to their mothers and realize that my mother is a technology entrepreneur and then those children, those daughters are then going to go on. And when they're in school, they're going to, amb they're going to have the ambition and the sight line to see that they too can be um, successful in the STEM field. And so we see that this is not just a, a single solution, but it's like multi-generational because the women entrepreneurs are themselves incredible role models. Yeah, it's a goosebump moment. Um, I, I would like to, um, 
I would like to pick up on the question of how we keep dialing on the question of how we break open these barriers and turn back to Christine because um, data matters and data driven decision management is becoming more and more important yet at the same time I feel like you presented that we have data that speaks for women in managerial positions and this is a conversation in Europe we've been having for a long time that companies know that having women on the board is something that will be economically beneficial to them and yet we have this dire situation of women hardly in any lead of positions with the top um, leading corporations. And this is also true in the um, energy sector still, especially when it comes to old energy. So I want to ask you based on that, do you feel we need other policy mechanisms and other, other pressure points on the economy as well to break open those walls or those ceilings? You know, later, uh, late, uh, late last year, early this year, we, we published a study uh, which looked at uh, strategies on how to uh, empower women in, in the energy field. And as a starting point, we thought of looking into other sectors like healthcare or banking or whatsoever, because we thought maybe some of them are more advanced and they have the brilliant strategies uh, for, for women, uh, to empower women and to advance them. And what we realized is actually, it's more or less the same in, in all different uh, sectors. Of, of course, some, especially those that are less perceived as less technical, are um, they have more women initially, but uh, it's the same that as you move up, the share of women uh, becomes uh, smaller. And, uh, and so, and, I don't think that we can, or, well, let's formulate it positively. I think what we need are quotas and targets. Uh, otherwise we will take centuries uh, to reach this equality because as Madam Commissioner has said it, when there are only men sitting around the table, making either a business or a policy decision, it's not, it's not inclusive. It's, it, it does not see the whole picture. And so uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it, it's better for the sake of everyone, but of course that means, especially in the energy sector, which is uh, quite traditional still and composed of lots of power networks, it means of course that some people will lose the power. And so uh, without uh, obliging companies uh, to get uh, quotas uh, and, and share of women on, on their boards, I think it's gonna take, far too long. And, uh, but what I have to say and what I have noticed uh, and what is important for me uh, in, in all this work, the whole uh, issue of gender equality is not only the, the, the thing women need to work on, it also concerns the men. And there are lots of champions out there, uh, men that are agreeing that it's much, more, it's much more pleasant, it's more fun, it's more productive to work uh, together that uh, as men and women and uh, and so uh, especially in our mentoring programs we have quite some men also that uh, that provide support to women uh, in in their sphere of um, uh, of influence to advance myself in my career I was lucky to have uh, have men as mentors so and women uh, and and but I think it's very very important because often this this conversation then you have the feeling it's all, always circles only around women and the issue is much too important uh, to neglect this other half uh, of the population not to pay tribute to it and uh, not to help advance it. Absolutely, such an incredibly important point. I full heartedly agree with. Um, Commissioner, you were nodding when Christine was speaking about the necessity of quotas because otherwise we'd be waiting for another couple of centuries to change the status quo. So I'm assuming that's something you agree with. Can you inform me if that's also a conversation taking place at the uh, AU level and um, or on, on different national levels? In, in, in Africa? Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what is not quantified does not exist. It's simple. So when we put a target, it's a target. And I'm really proud that the African Union, it's, uh, uh, it's the only international organization uh, or multilateral organization that has put a target for, for instance, for its leadership is perfect parity. So it's 50-50, women and men. That's by law. 
uh, and uh, for the workforce, forty uh, percent. Uh, we don't have chairman at the at the African Union. We only have chairpersons uh, because language matters, and so on and so forth. So we're taking we're taking the issue of gender very very seriously at all levels at the African Union. I did mention also, uh, uh, yes, of course. I mean we're. We, we set up this network for women in infrastructure that looks at the whole uh, value chain uh, of infrastructure and made sure that women are included throughout and not just as beneficiaries, uh, uh, but included uh, throughout. Also in our program for uh, uh, a program for development infrastructure uh, on the continent, the regional programs, uh, the regional projects, uh, one critical uh, uh, criteria for acceptance of, of any project is the gender aspect. So we, we, we're looking really, we take a, a gender lens into each project, making sure that it's, that it's inclusive and uh, and uh, that it's uh, it is rural, urban, but also uh, but also women and men. I wanted maybe to say something, Geraldine, that is. Not not as not a side note, but it's an important note. Uh, COVID nineteen. I mean, with all the problems that it's uh, causing worldwide, and especially in our continent, you know, in terms of hardship and loss of livelihoods, not only lives, uh, maybe and could very much be uh, an excellent opportunity when it comes to uh, energy transition in general and women in particular. I'm saying this because uh, uh, now all attention is given not only to energy access, but also energy security. Uh, countries are looking into, uh, uh, you know, when, when the supply chains were uh, uh, disrupted or almost halted worldwide, everyone looked at what they have because it did happen at the time when we almost were all disconnected from each other. So, uh, uh, a renewable energy provides a fantastic uh, opportunity to be used uh, uh, to, uh, to remedy not only the energy poverty, but also uh, uh, to address the energy uh, security, because while solar is there, wind is there, and uh, the abundance of these renewable uh, sources in Africa is, uh, is phenomenal. Now, why for women, particularly because, again, we have the technology, mini grid and off grid, that was mentioned uh, by uh, Catherine earlier, I think. Uh, the technology is there, and there's a, 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 now there's a frenzy across the continent, you know, to uh, look into uh, the uh, to, to use, you know, mini grids, uh, off grid, uh, the um, uh, decentralized uh, systems, uh, energy systems. And this will definitely positively impact women and also a great opportunity for women to get into the sector uh, uh, because we talk about different levels here. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm actually seeing like in every tragedy there's a silver lining. This could very much be the silver lining for Africa and African women in particular. A uh, very um, hopeful and therefore encouraging perspective to hear. I saw you give a nod, Catherine, and I think this taps in exactly to the approach also that you're taking. Are you also seeing this um, perspective and this silver lining in the current global pandemic crisis? Yes, we've been really um, amazed to see the resilience and the ingenuity that comes out of um, difficulties and the the Corona crisis, the COVID crisis has certainly presented us all with that. Um, what has come out of it is new ways of doing work, new ways of connecting, new ways of building business. And we see this happening all the time um, with our entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the, the Chinese character for crisis is um, a combination of the characters for danger and opportunity. And so I think as we look at this uh, COVID crisis right now, we see that exactly. We see really um, a, a really difficult situation for so, so many. And our heart goes out to people who for health or livelihoods or have lost their lives. And we see that as people are um, rebuilding now, as they're coming out of it and trying to rebuild their economies and rebuild their lives, something breaks open and opens up opportunity so that um, I think women will be able to step into positions 
because they've proven themselves that they haven't had before. I think that um, markets have uh, realized new ways of doing business. So yeah, I think that uh, we'll, we'll rebuild stronger and better. I would like to stay on this kind of positive and encouraging note. And before we close this discussion, I would very much like to invite you all individually just to share an outlook maybe for the next steps for your work, the next things you're hoping for, and maybe combine this a little bit with sharing also your personal strategy, because I know how tiring this constant struggle for more gender parity can get. And, and I fully heartedly agree with the educating men and not just educating women, but also how tiring that process can sometimes feel. So I hope that a lot of women are going to be watching this panel from young women who are out there demonstrating with Friday for Future or other social movements to women who are perhaps already established in their career but are finding it hard to stand their ground and I would like to invite you to give a few encouraging words maybe to those women listening to us but also share with us a little bit your next steps and perspectives and if I may pass the word to the commissioner first please thank you Sharanti well first of all engineering is fun so, uh, and you can beat men in their own name, just trust me, I've done it several times. Uh, uh, second, uh, uh, sector, it's, it's, it's the prerequisite for any kind of development in any sector. And energy needs gender responsive policies for the advancement of the sustainable development goals and Africa's uh, agenda 2063. In, important to close the energy education and training gap. Uh, important also to uh, make sure that uh, uh, women are in the decision-making uh, positions when it comes to energy. Uh, and uh, again, I reiterate that the African Union Commission is strongly supports the uh, empowerment of women in the energy sector, uh, specifically about infrastructure at large, and calls on all stakeholders to actively uh, participate in addressing these challenges and uh, 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 knowing that uh, this is the only way we will we help not only Africa recover, but also we help Africa grow and thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, if I may invite you next. Yes. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, I think that uh, we want to see our strategy and our goal, our, our vision is that uh, everyone everywhere has access to the clean energy they need to power their lives to prosperity and that women are central to achieving that, that we will be able to make sure that no one is left behind in energy access if we actually include everyone in that work and uh, including women in that work is essential. And at Solar Sister, that's what we will continue to do ourselves very practically on the ground at the grassroots and also by sharing our story globally so that others are able to be inspired and uh, take up this, this cause, this movement of women as being essential for clean energy access and um, empowering prosperity. And personally, um, I think my, my message would be that we each have our role to play that this will happen when all of us are engaged and each one of us has our role. We do what is right in front of us. I always, I'm an advocate of solving the problem that's in front of you. And um, I think each one of us can take up the problem in front of us and move forward. And it's, it's a big challenge, but I know that as we progress every day better, we will achieve it. Thank you so much. And over to you, Christine. Thank you. Well, you know, I have witnessed uh, the growth of this uh, this industry, the renewables industry. When I when I joined the sector in the 90s, it was in its infant stages, and especially in in my part of the world, people said renewable energy is that is that really something serious? It was mainly the environmentalists pushing it forward. I have witnessed it rise to a, a multi billion uh, dollar industry, and what encourages me is it's costs have come down so these technologies are not only deployed in uh, in, uh, in 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 OECD countries but they are global phenomenon and and those that have the, the biggest hunger for energy and the need for energy and access 
uh, also uh, have 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 them have access to them and can deploy them and and so renewables have really become a global phenomenon and that uh, that uh, I find very motivating and uh, and and I see on the other hand still a lot uh, and a long way to go and um, and it's yes it's tiring it's sometimes exhausting but it's also very rewarding. I remember when we set up our first mentoring program, we really, we had not many funds and we just went for it. Uh, and we had uh, a young woman from Ethiopia uh, as a mentee in one of the programs. And, uh, and she found it so inspiring that she went back to her country and set up a, a network of women in energy in Ethiopia. And this is for me really a success story because if we manage to uh, inspire others, uh, you, I mean, there's this beautiful um, proverb in uh, on the African continent: when you walk fast, uh, then walk alone. But then, when you want to go far, uh, go together. And and I think this this is this is really beautiful. And what on a personal basis, what really motivates me: I have a one-year-old daughter, and I want her uh, to uh, find a more uh, gender equal um, sector available or, or working conditions, whichever sector she wants to go in. And, uh, and this is what, what keeps me up. And, uh, what, uh, and also the, the work of the great people uh, all around the world that, that, uh, that, that uh, work in this field so that we can join forces and, and advance the cause more quickly. I would like to thank you all so much, not just for taking the time to be part of our discussion today, but for the inspiring work that you do. And I look forward to following that beyond this discussion. And yes, wish you all the best along the way for um, the continued fight towards gender equality in the renewable energy space. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for moderating.